It is now my pleasure to introduce the 15th president of Franklin and Marshall College, Dan Porterfield. Dr. P joined the FNM community in 2011 after 14 years at his alma mater, Georgetown University, where he served as a senior vice president for strategic development and as a professor of English. He earned his PhD in English literature at the City University of New York Graduate Center, was a Rhodes Scholar at Oxford, and enjoys teaching courses dealing with human rights, education, and social justice. His leadership in the areas of expanding college opportunity, student development, and articulating the value and power of the liberal arts has drawn national attention, and he writes and speaks regularly as a powerful advocate for FNM and our tradition of education. Now, these academic accomplishments and professional accolades are more than enough to inspire us all, and yet anyone who has spent time with Dr. P knows he is so much more than what a simple bio may tell you. When I transferred to FNM, I had an image of what a college president would be. A little distant, maybe a little clueless about what's going on with students' lives. Boy, was I wrong. From being friends with him on Facebook, to welcoming me into his home for dinner with my fellow transfers, running into him at Posse Plus Retreat, and attending all our rowing banquet dinners, Dr. P is far from the president I envisioned. I'd barely gotten used to that, when he showed up in my office this summer while I was working for Vital Voices and proved himself a powerful advocate for gender equality and human rights. Not distant, not clueless, more like completely in touch with everything that's going on here. That being said, please join me in welcoming President Porterfield. Uh, thank you, Jamie, for that uh, lovely introduction and for all the ways that you uh, lead and serve at Franklin and Marshall. Um, I think it is possible to be both in touch and clueless. Um, my kids tell me almost every day uh, just how clueless I am. And, um, uh, and Jamie, it has been a lot of fun to watch you as a transfer from another great school create your FNM experience here uh, in rowing, in your coursework, um, and in this tremendous summer internship that, uh, that Jamie had as a Sidwise Fellow in Washington, D.C. at this organization called Vital Voices, which was founded by uh, Mrs. Clinton uh, when she was finishing her term as, uh, as First Lady, before she became Senator. And Vital Voices does people-serving work uh, on behalf of women and families around the world in three areas, human rights, entrepreneurship, and democracy building. Um, and we have some alums who work there, and so I did provide a, a drop-by surprise visit, which we then web webcast on Facebook this summer, because I think it's really important work, and it's great that you were working at um, a think tank, an advocacy organization that might well be of even greater influence uh, in the years to come. So great job, Jamie, thank you. Um, and thank you to the Common Hour Committee, uh, Sophia and Fred, for your leadership and for all who helped to make the Common Hour a great success. Um, the title of my talk is Creativity, Innovation, and discovery, and the, the common hour is that, uh, creativity, innovation, discovery. It's an innovation in itself that we made it. Um, I think those three values enhance uh, our academic community and they enhance life. Uh, creativity, innovation, discovery, invention, they bring joy, they bring insight, they bring togetherness, progress, new ways of thinking, new ways of belonging. I feel that almost every day on the campus. To be, to be older in a college campus is to work with the young. And when we work with the young, we are always inspired by the freshness of your perspectives and your questions, your ideas. And from that comes a creative power that we who are older can't, cannot invent on our own. But we need you to be our partners. Well, I probably never felt more that the power of creativity here um, than one day last May when I went in to see the senior art show uh, in the Phillips uh, uh, Art Gallery. And it was, uh, all of the work was superb. And there was one piece by Alejandro Zavala, who graduated in May, um, that especially stopped me, it struck me. It's called Asta Laris, Down to the Root. Here are just a couple images from Alejandra's work of art.
Now, it's, it's 43 portraits of Franklin and Marshall College undergraduates, all of whom, like Alejandra, define as a part of their identity being Mexican-American. The final slide shows portraits of 43 Mexican students who were kidnapped um, and who disappeared and are presumed murdered uh, two years ago. They were heading to a protest. I think in part Alejandra was responding to the reality that if her parents had not brought her and her brother to America, to Coatesville, Pennsylvania, eventually to Franklin and Marshall College, perhaps she would have been on that bus. She paid tribute to the 43 Mexican students who were killed, and she protested their murder, while also drawing attention to 43 students here at Franklin and Marshall College, who might have also been college students in Mexico, but for defining courageous choices their families made to bring them to America. There's more to say about this work of art, but it reminds me so much of the power of creativity and innovation and discovery to take us to places that we hadn't known to want to go. And that is just beautiful. To show uh, creativity, innovation, and discovery uh, across our work in the college community, I want to say a word about a vision that we have of the school that's very widely shared. And then I'd like to provide some updates and announcements relative, relevant to this topic. Um, so first, a few years ago, we embarked upon a set of campus conversations, which included our students, our, our professional staff, our faculty, board members, alums, parents, to chart a future direction for the institution responsive to the world that we live in, a world that's always changing. What emerged was a strategic document that was approved by our board and our faculty that was called Claiming Our Future. And one of the things that the document captured was a consensus about a vision for Franklin and Marshall College. I'll read a sentence. We seek to elevate FNM as a leading national liberal arts college. Leading national liberal arts college in ways that are empowering for students, authentic to the college, relevant for tomorrow, and sustainable for generations to come. From there, from that sort of starting point, that, that vision, that, that, that guiding aspiration, we as a community have been doing tremendous work towards the vision to develop f and in, in indeed in that way. Um, f and is a national institution with impacts that extend far beyond uh, the, the zip code in which we are placed, the community that we're fortunate to be in. We've made impacts with our talent strategy that has attracted national attention. We've made impacts by deepening the richness of our intellectual work, like, for example, the creation of the Connections curriculum. We made impacts by expanding our holistic focus on students, like with the creation of the College House system, like the, with the creation of the Office of Student and Postgraduate Development. And we've made impacts by helping to solve national problems that are intellectual in nature and claiming the national stage with those solutions. Well, in order to do those things well and to live just the enduring values of the college, it is key to foster creativity, innovation, and discovery. Now, new students, I can appreciate it if you're, you're thinking, OK, but how does that relate to you know, teaching me what I'm here to learn? So the answer is threefold. First, our faculty are and must constantly renew the intellectual material to ensure that they are teaching at the cutting edge, the leading edge of our disciplines. It's crucial for a college faculty to do. Second, liberal arts education is in part about helping you develop a knowledge base that will be a, you know, serve you for you know, the rest of your lives. But even more, it's about unlocking your potential to be a creator, a discoverer, or an innovator. Not simply to answer questions posed by others, but to pose questions no one's ever thought to look for, and perhaps find answers no one's ever imagined coming upon. And then third, 
the mission, the very work of any national liberal arts college is to create new knowledge for the world that we are a part of. That is part of the faculty's job, to create knowledge that impacts understanding and makes differences in the world. And as a result, the faculty are different in some ways than educators you've had before, just as dedicated to you, just as committed to outstanding classroom experience. But also, there's a part of our identity where we are trying to shape how others well beyond the campus understand the nature of reality. We must create new ideas. We have to innovate in ways that solve problems. We have to discover answers. We have to look for the areas that have thwarted other people and say, maybe we can be the ones that figure it out. And we have a big competitive advantage, I think, as a knowledge-creating entity, because uh, our faculty are not removed from one another, as, as they are at many larger institutions. You know, the campuses are so big that the buildings are a bus trip away, and the faculty don't see each other. Never mind shape a curriculum together like we do here. Because we're in close proximity, we can team up, and we can bring the resources to multiple of multiple, multiple disciplines to the challenges that we want to try to understand. And including bringing the resources is realizing that your own discipline has constraints, too. I'm an English prof. It makes con English can make many contributions to society. In fact, it's a tremendous resource for understanding human rights discourse. But it can't answer every problem that human rights needs answered. And sometimes literature participates in the, the denial of human rights, and not just in the furthering of human rights. And faculty are always thinking and can do that here about the resources and the constraints of our fields and how then combining, mashing it up, can perhaps make it possible for us to find solutions that the bigger institutions don't try to look for. So in other words, we are doing the work both of invention and of creating the context in which invention can happen. We're doing both. Both. We have to, we, both require intentionality to invent, to create, to discover, and to provide the setting where invention, creativity, and discovery happens. Now, so a few updates on things that have happened since we were together last. And I'm, and I'm gonna focus on, on updates that relate to this the, the, the sort of duality, the creation of knowledge and the creation of an environment where knowledge is created. So first, uh, this is a, a historic moment in the life of the institution, and uh, for many reasons, but one of which is that we now have a new chair of our Board of Trustees. She joins us here today. Uh, it's Sue Washburn, a member of the class of 1973, the first class to admit women for a four-year Franklin and Marshall experience. Um, uh, Sue has been a member of our Board of Trustees for many years. Uh, she is a leader in higher education, philanthropy, and strategy. Uh, she is joined today by her partner, Kristen Reeder. Sue is the first alumna to serve as chair of the Board of Directors. Sue, thank you so much for being here today. And, and new students, I think you might be wondering, well, you know, will I see Ms. Washburn again. Uh, the answer is yes. Who lives in Lancaster is a is a very uh, dedicated and caring and loving presence in our community, and has mentored many students here and is is a regular part of life in the community along with Kristen. In fact, Kristen will be has a, a, a display of refugees in in uh, Lancaster that will be shown in in the Phillips Museum later this year. Uh, a second uh, a second update from when we were last together. Um, we graduated about 550 people in May of 2016 with the governor of the Commonwealth, Tom Wolf, as our speaker, and he gave a great speech uh, that challenged students and all of us to embrace our civic duty, to confront with civility and common purpose the challenges and problems that beset our nation and the world. And I realize this summer has not been a time when we have seen models of civility in the public and political space. But Governor Wolf's message was an important one. Uh, because if people that care about the country, care about the world, and care about respecting others across the supposed lines of difference don't get involved in politics, 
who will it be left to? One of the things I hope we experience together this year is rich debate and discussion during the election season on campus. You only get to experience a presidential election you know, once if you're in a four-year uh, college experience, and I hope this one is a, is a very, very rewarding one to you, and it's, and it's exciting that we have some terrific speakers uh, coming to campus. Uh, uh, since we were last together in athletics, we cheered on uh, our golf team, which, went to, which finished 12th in the country in NCAAs, and our women's lacrosse, which went to the Final Four uh, for the second straight year. Uh, since we were together last, 120 students worked in th some form of research on campus in partnership with faculty, uh, unlocking all kinds of learning uh, and growth for this year uh, together. Over the summer, thanks to an amazingly dedicated facilities team and finance team, we were able to, to again embark upon a very ambitious set of renovations so that our spaces can be um, at, you know, appropriate for the intensity and importance of the work that we're doing within them. It was exciting uh, that Kuiper had its first renovation in 35 years and is looking pretty great. <laughs> uh, ben Franklin North was renovated, Ben Franklin South last year. We'll get to Thomas. Um, uh, uh, next, uh, the Black Cultural Center had a renovation across the first floor with a new kitchen, which is going to be terrific. Uh, the Student Health and Wellness Center was created uh, on Harrisburg Pike in the, um, uh, near the ASFC with state-of-the-art facilities for health and counseling. We had been doing uh, student health and counseling for something like 60 years in the Apple Building, and it's great to be in brand new space uh, with our outstanding teams uh, providing uh, those services for our students. Uh, and we created a new social space for students, 1787, which is already being used a lot, both daytime for, great, for lots of different kinds of meetings, and I hope at night for lots of parties and gatherings. We have two new projects, again in the spirit of creating the ecosystem within which great discovery can happen, that are in development right now. Um, uh, the first is uh, Harwood Commons, which is being renovated, uh, the, the Apple Building being renovated as a new home for both the Office of Student and Postgraduate Development and the Ware Institute for Civic Engagement. Uh, that is what it will look like. It doesn't look like that today. Uh, but we will have a space that um, responds to the importance and the centrality of the mission of both of those parts of FNM, uh, with the funds to do it given to us by our alum as part of the capital campaign that we're in, Brett Harwood. Um, I think that Ann Hughes may be here, the new director of the Ware Institute. Ann, if you are here, would you mind if, we, if I call you? There she is. So, Ann, thank you for joining us, and welcome to the community. Uh, the, other, the other major new project that's being done right now is that uh, we have received approvals from all the local authorities, and there were many, and from the Board of Trustees to break ground on the Shattuck Stadium, which is a new, nicely appointed uh, small stadium seating 2,500 uh, fans for uh, women's and men's lacrosse, football, uh, and for women's and men's soccer. You know, we don't have to play women's and men's soccer there, but we may want to. Um, with locker room space and community space, opportunity for intramurals. I think we'll be able to show films on the, uh, on the scoreboard, be able to host the Lancaster community. This is part of about a 10-year plan on that part of the campus, for those that are new, to develop the resources so that the athletics programs are batched together in one site, um, which will then give us the ability, in you know, really reasonably short period of time, to imagine a different uh, front to the campus with the, what is now the Williamson Field, uh, becoming, at least in the short term, perhaps a great big open space for student recreation, but someday we'll be able to house some additional academic facilities and perhaps a residential facility on that site. Um, this summer, uh, uh, two of your classmates did some pretty important work on the national stage um, uh, in competing to represent America in the Paralympic Games. Uh, uh, Megan Liang, who may be here, but I didn't email her, um, uh, so uh, if she's not, uh, give her a high five when you see her. She nearly qualified in both the 50 and 100 meter freestyle events for the games. And then uh, uh, junior Becker, Becca Myers is in Rio right now, where she will be competing for gold in five different swimming events. I think a lot of this is going to end up being televised and webcast in different ways. And uh, um, you know, Becca may well um, be back on campus in a few weeks uh, with some amazing stories to share. Um, also over the summer, again in that theme of creating the ecosystem where the important work can happen, a group of faculty, staff, and students dedicated a tremendous amount of time and thought to creating um, 
the Day of Dialogue, which will be held on October the 5th. Uh, Stephanie uh, McNulty, an Associate Professor of Government, has been helping to lead the work. That's a day where we won't hold classes, but instead we will uh, gather together in a variety of settings, including right here with uh, a, a dialogue that in will involve uh, Beverly Tatum, the scholar and president emerita of Selman College, um, to talk about uh, identity in the context of a community, FNM community and the communities within our community. And it promises to be an extremely rich day. I hope that all of you uh, will take part, and I especially would like to thank the faculty for the leadership to decide to host this. The very next day, we will have um, uh, cultural commentator and uh, an NBA legend, Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, uh, speaking and on campus as a Mueller Fellow. Uh, and we also have, we have so many, so many lectures, so many important speakers coming. Just to highlight two, Robin D'Angelo, who is a scholar of white privilege and the construction of white identity, will be speaking at a common hour. And um, Abdullahi Ahmed An-Naim, who's a professor of law at Emory, whose work in human rights and sort of the cross-religious framework for trying to identify commonalities in, in human rights is speaking uh, because of a series that our Africana Studies program is putting on. Um, his topic, his title, is What is an American Muslim? Crucial topic for us uh, in, in, in these days and weeks. Um, well, with, with all of this happening uh, to provide the setting and the context for richness, it's also very exciting to see that, um, that the talent strategy is working and that we're attracting a still deeper pool of great students to the school. So it, the numbers are now in, and we've had two straight years now of averaging 7,000 applications to Franklin and Marshall College. The previous all-time high had been 5,600, and most years it was in the high fours or the low fives. Um, it's not just the numbers, but the depth of talent in this student body, the wide range of backgrounds from which the, the incoming students come, um, uh, the, uh, the interests and passions and cultural experiences and backgrounds are spectacular. It does happen to be 2020, again, for I think the fifth straight year, uh, the most diverse incoming class in Franklin and Marshall history. And that will continue um, because the aims and aspirations of a great institution must be to find talent in every corner of the world, bring it together so that you who are young can create futures that we who are older may not live in but surely want to be better than the one that we have had ourselves. And finally, over the summer, again in the theme of building the ecosystem for creativity, um, we made a lot of progress in the leadership phase of our capital campaign, which is an eight-year campaign to ask our alums, our families, our supporters, the Lancaster community, the National Foundation world to invest in the promise of Franklin and Marshall College. Um, we're through two years of it so far. It's called the leadership phase. The campaign will become a public kind of uh, moment in, uh, uh, in two more years. And, um, but the, these last two years are the two highest years of fundraising uh, consecutively in school history. We've raised now, thanks to the leadership of our advancement program and all who work with advancement, more than $80 million uh, in the campaign. And last year we had the single biggest fundraising year in school history. Um, the goals of the campaign are the core priorities of the school, academic excellence, financial aid, and the holistic student experience. Now, as an example of sort of like the momentum that you get from excellent fundraising in support of a real vision for how a school as a national institution will make a difference, um, you may recall, those of you that were there, that at, at commencement we announced that we received a $10 million gift uh, from one of our members of our Board of Trustees, Ben Winner, from the class of 67, and his wife, Susan Winner, to, to help to create a new visual arts center uh, as part of, eventually, a full quad for the visual arts located uh, behind Shadfak Library. Uh, and the plan that we have um, will, will involve, over time, the removal of, uh, of our current uh, facility that we use for visual arts and replacing it with a new design. Now, this, is, this will make a huge statement about Franklin and Marshall's commitment to creativity, innovation, and discovery. Um, State-of-the-art space for art, art history, photography, sculpture, design, film, media studies. I think there'll be computer graphics work, I suspect, done in there. Um, maybe we'll end up doing virtual reality work in there. There's, there's, a, there's a, a huge array of opportunities for us to, uh, to, to enhance creativity in the visual arts. And, um, the faculty have been a major uh, voice in the design of the facility. 
which I think will itself be a work of art and an attention getter uh, for Franklin and Marshall College. Um, led by uh, our provost and dean of the faculty, Joel Martin, uh, along with the art and art history faculty the, and the film program, um, we conducted a process in which we had basically an international competition uh, for architects to invite them to submit proposals. And I think we received about 20 proposals for this, this new structure and whittled it down, uh, interviewed the last five, uh, interviewed the final two a couple times, went and viewed some of their, their facilities around the country, and ended up selecting a colleague whose name is Stephen Hall, H-O-L-L. -L. And I would encourage you to Google him and see the work that Stephen has done around the country, um, at Princeton, at Houston, at Kansas City, in, in, uh, in Shanghai, uh, professor at Columbia, uh, really one of, the, one of the architects in America that other scholars of architecture go to, you know, to meet with and go see his work. Um, and uh, here's, a, here's a little bit of a sketch of the area. You can see the North Museum uh, here on the left and the Shadfak Library on the right. And then that odd-shaped building, in fact, there's never been a building in human history that's been shaped like that before. That odd-shaped building is what Stephen has come up with for our Visual Arts Center. And he, he took his inspiration from the campus. He walked the campus a couple times, learned the history of the school, the history of the architecture. He actually loves the old main building and saw a lot of uh, sort of innovation within 19th century Scottish architecture reflected in, the, in that part of the building, especially the upper part. Um, and he wanted to give us, among other things, a building to replace the Herman Arts building that would cast views on, um, on Old Main. He also has an idea that we should open up the back of Shadfak Library with a glass enclosure so that the new building um, is very present to those who are in Shadfak. And at the back of the building doesn't end Shadfak, but rather is an opening to a second entrance. And the library becomes a passageway into the Visual Arts Quad. What I really love, though, about this design, and he, he uses light in ways that are majestic and shaped and curves and contours. Um, it, it will inspire creativity. Uh, but what I really love is that he based the shape of the building around the oldest living creatures on our campus, the trees. And he situated the design within the root structure in such a way so that the building would give further life to the trees would animate the trees, and so the students and the faculty working within the building would be doing art within the trees. And so the second slide shows, again, at the conceptual level, what it might look like. Well, that's not what it'll look like, but there is a slide that I, <laughs> that, uh, there it is. Um, and uh, we'll probably have a pond of some type in that quad to create a destination in the quad itself, along with maybe a coffee shop at coming off the back of the library. Um, but the, the, the actual studios are up in the trees, and one of the, there's, there's a million features. I'm not going to describe them all now. We'll have many opportunities to talk about this, but one of the really cool educational features is that these beautifully uh, appointed studios, very high ceiling where students do their work, then are looked in upon by studios one level up where the faculty will do their work. And so the faculty are being able to almost gaze within to the student uh, studio, and the stu students will be able to go up to see the faculty doing their work. Something that's very difficult for us to do right now. Our faculty don't do their artistic work on campus. Well, you know, I, I want every single student in this school to feel that you have the opportunity to learn about the creativity within you and to take the risk of drawing or art, film, whatever you want to do, for that matter, any other art, dance, music, anything. Um, but this will allow you to also witness how the faculty who are working artists do their work, which is something that I think will have uh, just, you know, indescribable benefits to, to many of you. Well, there's work to do. We have to continue the fundraising for the project. We have to go eventually through what's called a project of design development, where you get into the nitty gritty about where is the elevator and how does the heat get in and out. Um, we're right now we're looking at a model uh, where we might be able to draw the, the power from the earth. It's called geothermal. Um, we will you know, continue to update the campus on it, but I think that um, you know, we may be able to break ground in, a, in two years. I can't promise that. It might be sooner. It can't be much sooner. Uh, the key, though, is that our capital campaign gives us a framework to go out and build upon the Winter family's generous gift and secure the next um, roughly you know, five to $10 million of, of investment so that we are secure that we can create this facility. Um, and 
Uh, and I, I look forward to the day when Stephen Hall comes here and presents, because I think that in and of itself will be listening to a master artist as he talks about his craft. So it takes a campaign, a capital campaign, to be able to do some new investment in a great college community. And as I said, we're in the second year of our campaign. Last year at this time, I was able to announce that one of our alums, um, Eric Rakow, with his wife, Sari, had made an investment of $1 million in F&M that was half for financial aid and the other half for summer uh, internships for students in the sciences. Uh, today, I'm delighted to be able to make two more announcements of similarly important creative investments uh, in the school. First, uh, and neither of the donors is here today, so we, we, we can maybe clap for them, but we don't have to, we, they're not going to stand. Um, first, Mary Hyman, who is uh, the wife of the 1947 alumnus, Sigmund Hyman, has committed a bequest of 1.5 million for financial aid and for an endowed student research fund that will support innovative student research and discovery in natural sciences, business, and economics. And this, this blending, putting together both financial aid and investment in program, it's kind of like sort of making it possible for great kids to be here and then making it happen. Um, it's been so inspiring to me how many of our alums have chosen to invest in need-based financial aid while also investing in programmatic enhancements in what we're doing here. Um, and then secondly, uh, our trustee, Tony Kreisel, who is an, is an active trustee, and you'll have a chance to meet if you haven't already, and his wife, Dr. Kimberly Farris, have made a commitment of $1 million to establish the Farris Kreisel Mindfulness Program to bolster our comprehensive wellness initiatives and to give our student health and counseling program a big shot in the arm in order to have many more resources to focus on the wide range of activities that fall within the category and emerging field, and emerging expertise of, well, of, of mindfulness. Um, mindfulness may itself have a tremendous benefit to many of our students and our, our, our faculty and staff towards the goal of being an innovator and a creator. And uh, it will be a lot of fun for us to be able to host a lecture from a leading uh, scholar practitioner of mindfulness in the spring. Um, but this is, again, the kind of investment that a campaign makes possible. And without a campaign, it's hard to free up resources to do something so innovative. I think we'll be on the forefront of liberal arts colleges um, in doing work in mindfulness and having real resources for our, for our community. Um, Th those two announcements we made online today, and there'll be a lot of celebration within the alumni community, and a lot of thanks, and of course, other alums will see that and start to think for themselves and imagine, what am I going to do that will allow me to make my impact at my alma mater? And just as you students want to be, want to do that, want to have an impact now with your education, with your contributions to campus life, I hope that you will also see the value of having an ongoing impact in supporting your college after you are here. Um, I think that's something that, uh, that is a form of leadership, giving back to your school and shaping the direction of your school by making sure that the students who are, who are there in the future have access to the resources that are at the, at the state of the art. Now, I have a, one more announcement I want to make about the campaign, and that is that I'm very excited to announce that um, we have new leadership of the campaign. Um, joining us today is an F&M uh, alumna, parent, and trustee um, named Susan Clare, class of 73, who with her husband Lenny, who is class of 72, have agreed to serve as the first two co-chairs of our comprehensive campaign. And what that means is that Susan is going to be helping to organize our work and is going to be going out and creating events and opportunities for alums to ask other alums to help make this school resource the way we need it to be for the aspirations that we have. Um, she will be out representing you and us a lot over the next few years. Um, and uh, Susan is, is, uh, has been deeply engaged in Franklin Marshall College uh, ever since she was a student. She and Lenny are donors to many projects that make a difference right now. They have a financial aid fund. Uh, they 
uh, were the leaders of the fundraising for the Philadelphia Writers' House, uh, and they made the gift that named the Clare Center for Jewish Life. Um, Susan, thank you for doing this and for your commitment to be a leadership donor in the campaign, and please join me in recognizing and thanking Susan. Notice class of 73. So this is a second person who walked onto this campus in 1969 where there had, had, there had been a woman or two who had taken classes as a family member of an F&M employee at different times. We hadn't had a degree program organized you know, to, for, for, to, to give women the opportunity. Um, two members of that class now are leading the school, leading the development of our future. And who knows if that's what you were thinking about when you walked in here as the pioneers, you know, breaking through glass ceilings, glass walls, glass blackboards, um, and coming in to claim your education. Uh, but what an impact they have made. And you sometimes will hear me talk about today's talent strategy. Going co-ed was the most successful talent strategy this school has ever had. I mean, you know. And just, just think about this for a second. So in 1975, there were about 500 women who were students at FNM. Sue and Susan had graduated. We were only in our sixth year of accepting women students, about 500 or so. Today, four of those 500 are Joan Fallon, the inventor of therapies to help mitigate the effects of autism, who I talked about at the convocation. Wanda Austin, the CEO of the Aerospace Corporation of America, a first-generation kid from the Bronx, a math major, who's now in charge of America's space defense and in charge of America's weather satellites. There was Mary Shapiro, who became the first woman to be appointed chair of the SEC, who regulated Wall Street after the 2008 uh, financial crisis, and Patricia Harris, the first deputy mayor of New York City and now CEO and president of Bloomberg Philanthropies, which means she's giving away $30 billion to improve the human condition. That was four of the 500 students on campus were women at that time. Think about the impact, the ROI for America of F&M's talent strategy. That is astonishing. But guess what? It's true right now whether in those kinds of roles or in any other walk of life, the future leadership of the country, of now of many countries, of society, is right now claiming its place in our classrooms and labs and playing fields. And we can't know how it will unfold, but given your talent and the quality of this academic program, we can be sure that 40 years from now, somebody will be standing here pointing out some of you You'll be back, it might be a different building, but you'll be back, and you'll be the ones following in the footsteps of Susan and Sue. And I hope you'll feel a great deal of pride in that. So a, 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 a final thought here about creativity and innovation, discovery. You see, you see it, how does it actually happen? It happens at three levels. It happens in the work of the faculty, it happens in the work of the students, and it happens at the level of the agency of the institution. Each one, each, each arena leads to innovation and discovery. You know, in the, in the faculty and students, if you're new, you're going to get a, just a great chance to learn about this right away, right now, today, tomorrow. Um, we, have, we have professors who are asking some of the biggest questions you can imagine. For example, Professor Joel Eigen, uh, in sociology is asking, well, how do the claims made by neuroscientists to have isolated regions of the brain associated with aggression and violence challenge our deep-seated convictions about free will and about the capacity of free choice? Huge questions. The nature of free will. Uh, Eric Talviti in computer science is asking, how can we create computer programs that can accomplish new tasks, like, for example, driving cars. Eric received this major NSF award, a career grant for his work. 
how do we better understand ancient civilizations with so much new technology now to allow us to do that? Professors Gretchen Myers and Ann Steiner were part of a team that included students that excavated last summer an enormous slab in a place called Potricola in Italy. The largest inscription of Etruscan language ever found, including 35 or 40 words that had never been seen in writing before. That's the kind of work the faculty are doing, big topics. And then you start to see it in the recognition that the faculty receive. You know, Kate Plass um, in, uh, uh, was, was a, is a chemistry professor who won the Henry Dreyfus Teacher Scholar Award, this national award for innovation and success in teaching, which, believe it or not, Ken Brewer in the same department had won the year before. Um, Meg Day in English, who, whose current work, she's a poet, involves trans studies and trans poetics, just earned the Amy Lowell Traveling Scholarship. She'll be back in 2017. She's traveling right now. Um, and then just today, five faculty members, Clara Moore, Beckley Davis, Pablo Jenik, Dave Roberts, all in biology, and Tim Roth in psychology, received a National Science Foundation grant of more than $400,000 to acquire a specialized microscope to do high-level scholarship, um, which, is, which will make a huge difference to you, students, as you take the opportunity to go deeper. This is, this is you know, there's always the faculty working at the edge of knowledge, at the outer boundary of knowledge, pressing, pushing, critiquing, disrupting, but also honoring received knowledge because there is wisdom in the past, too. It's not just change. And this is subtle. This is subtle, but students, the faculty are subjecting their discoveries to outside evaluation all the time. That's what we do. We aren't our own frame of reference. Everything I just described involved an outside engagement where scholars of equal distinction and renown evaluated our faculty's work and saw its enormous value. That's what we're preparing you to do. The students can't be the fr your own frame of reference. We want your frame of reference to be excellence outside of the campus as well as within it. Impact outside of the campus, discovery outside of the campus. And that's why when I showed that work of art at the beginning um, that Alejandra made, I wanted to make the point now that it wasn't only a great work of art, which it was, it didn't only um, enhance our understanding of this school and of a group of students whose lives were stolen in Mexico, but also it was so good uh, that the college bought it. It was that good that we bought Alejandra's work so that it wouldn't just, you know, go into her basement. Um, because by outside standards, that work was at the very highest level for where she is in her education. Similarly, we have four stu five students who've been working this summer to develop a new history of the college that will be presented as a part of the Day of Dialogue. It's exciting to me that the faculty are teaming up with students to allow you to be partners together in creating new narratives that um, address silences part of our lives. And then there's the way some of our students are creating new enterprises outside of the campus itself, which essentially are subjected to the competitive world of sort of like investment. So there's a, a young graduate named Will Kiefer who's created a power lifting organization that works with kids in Lancaster who are on probation in order to give them the feeling of having bodily autonomy, control of their lives, while also giving them mentoring in, 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 uh, in studies and support as they look for work. Uh, and Lisheen G, another 2014 graduate, stayed in Lancaster and has created her own vegan food company which competed and got a stand now at Central Market. Never forget, students, that we view you as creators and that we believe that to be a creator, you have to take the risk of subjecting your work to outside interpretation and evaluation. I'm going to close now with a reflection about the school, the college itself, as an agent of innovation, creativity, and discovery. Last year, the college presidents around the country voted on which schools they thought were the most innovative, and the three that tied for number one were Bard College, Davidson College, and Franklin and Marshall College. I don't think we get up and walk around every day thinking of ourselves as the number one most innovative liberal arts college in America, and we, that's not actually a healthy way to think. A healthy way to think is to say, what work can we do that adds value to the world? And then let's promote it and make sure others know what we're doing. 
Well, as an institution, in terms of our agency in the world, impacting the world together, not only in our individual pursuits, there's been some big things that we've done. With the leadership of the faculty and the students combined, we created a STEM Posse program, which has now been picked up by five other great institutions. It's a national model of success, and we were the first ones to do it. We created a summer program called f and College Prep. It's been replicated on five other campuses now. Again, a national model for how to provide opportunity to high-striving, high-talent, uh, rising high school seniors. Faculty teach in this program every summer, which is why it's so great. We got involved running something called the Pennsylvania College Advising Corps, which, uh, in which we provide college counseling to kids of all interests and backgrounds in rural PA schools uh, and, and here at McCaskey High School in Lancaster and other schools. That work is so good that we've been funded repeatedly. We now have 33 young uh, employees, most of them young alums, working all across the state. We're working through virtual college counseling to give great kids the opportunity to learn about what you're doing and why they should want to do it too. And those are just a couple of the areas where the school's agency is making a difference well beyond uh, the 17604 zip code. Now I want to leave you, I want to leave you with, uh, for, for, with a, uh, a clip that I think speaks to the power that we have together to make differences that impact the world for the better. Education Secretary John King has only been officially in his position about a month and a half, taking over for Arne Duncan, who served for the first seven years of President Obama's administration. But King has inherited a very full plate, including the successor to No Child Left Behind, increasing resegregation of public schools, and a higher education admissions process he likens to a caste system. I sat down with him earlier today as part of our Making the Grade series on education. Even in terms of higher ed, you've said before that there's almost a caste system of colleges and universities in the admissions process. So how do we change that? I think of a place like Franklin and Marshall that's committed to enrolling low-income students, has raised their academic standards at the same time as they've enrolled more low-income students, and they're providing the supports necessary to ensure that those students graduate. And so I, I think there's a bully pulpit role for the administration to play, uh, but we've also got to make sure the resources are there. And that's why the Pell Grant program is so important. That's why the president has added $1,000 to the average Pell Grant uh, since the administration began. It's why we, we think it's important to let students access Pell Grants in the summer, mm -hmm. uh, because that will help low-income students stay on track to graduation. Uh, so there's both, a, there's both a moral responsibility that higher ed institutions have and a responsibility that government has to provide the resources to support all of our citizens in making it through higher education. I don't know if you heard that the way I heard that, but what I heard the Secretary of Education just say is that the solution to the American challenge of ensuring that all students get the opportunity they've earned is two things. One, in invest in Pell Grants, and two, follow the example of Franklin and Marshall College. And you deserve that. I want to turn now and, and uh, invite uh, you to come to the mic if you have a question. Uh, for the new students, our tradition is that students are encouraged and invited to ask the first questions. Um, you heard uh, Professor Owen say earlier, if it's any way to hold your seats until the end of the common hour, that's a good thing. Now, I don't want to put the spotlight on people that have to get up and go somewhere, but you can practice that today because it's less important to me, actually, in a sense for me personally. But when we have guests here, it really is great when you stay to engage through the Q&A. Um, so any questions uh, for me? This is Wyatt, who is our student body president, uh, or I should say the, the co-president of Franklin and Marshall College. <laughs> Hi, Dr. P. Um, I'm curious in how we create in innovation, but how do we sustain a culture at Franklin and Marshall College that really sustains innovation? And if you could mention in your answer talking about faculty and student relationships. Yeah, thank you. Um, OK, that's a big question. How do we sustain and grow a culture of creativity, innovation, and discovery? I, I have a couple answers. They're not ranked in importance, but so A, the faculty-student mentoring relationship is key. New students, go see your profs in their offices. Not only because you maybe have a question or, or you're worried about something, but just go see them. 
bring in a newspaper, ask them about one of the articles, find out why they got into their field. Or the question I love to promote, ask the faculty what work they're doing that's on the cutting edge of their field in scholarship or in teaching. Ask them to almost step outside of the conversation to help you look at it from above, almost, well, here's what I'm doing as an educator, here's what I'm doing as a creator. We want to talk to you that way, students. We want to engage with you at the level of our work. So that's the, that's the big one, the faculty-student relationship. And students, it is incumbent upon you to go open the door. The door is open, walk through the door, put it that way. The professor has a cookie, go take the cookie. Um, it's, up, it's up to you, because the faculty will also show respect for you and won't you know, push you and demand that you come in to see them. Secondly, we have to have the resources. That means a strong financial aid program, it means outstanding classrooms and laboratories, it means uh, excellent spaces where students can learn and spaces where students can socialize and be together. Uh, it, it, the, the, our capital campaign is about creating that, that physical environment in part. Third, it's got to have engaged students. Uh, I'll say to anybody who wants to invest in Franklin and Marshall College, I will stand that this student body is as talented and great as any student body in the country, with the added advantage that they're getting a better education than everybody else. But we, we also must continue to recruit top students to the school. For any student who's here, if somebody shows up here next year at Franklin and Marshall College, and they say to me, hi, Dr. Porterfield, I'm here because Coleman Klein told me to go here. Or I'm here, Dr. P, because Michelle Bailey said this is a great school. I will give Coleman or Michelle, you're going to graduate, but nevertheless, I'll give them a book. Any student, I'll give you a book. If you help attract a great student to this school. And then it's got to be a book that we can read for fun, though. Uh, I'm not buying textbooks that you'd have to buy anyway. I want to buy, like, novels and histories. Um, and then another thing, and this is, this is key, is that to, to create, to explore, to invent, to reconceive, we have to have an environment that supports academic and intellectual freedom. We have to have a, a commerce of ideas flowing around. We have to be able to speak, to say what's on our mind, to listen. By providing an environment of academic freedom, what it says is that the faculty, and this is well enshrined in American higher education, the faculty can teach from their expertise what their expertise tells them is to be taught. It's a crucial commitment that American higher education makes to your learning students is giving the faculty the, the academic freedom to teach from their expertise. Crucial, crucial freedom. Any, any school worth its name protects the academic freedom of faculty. And a companion idea is that we promote and support free expression by all members of the community. And free expression has the value uh, in, a, in an academic community of giving us the opportunity to test ideas and bounce them off of one another, to make a statement, hear a counterargument, and qualify it. And I can't tell you how many times I personally have changed my understanding based on someone's comment back about the first effort I made to express what it was I thought I believed. We have to be able to do that. We have to be able to, we have to, be able to talk and listen and engage in a robust exchange of ideas. And, and I've frankly seen that at this school every day that I've been here. I mean, how many schools have a common hour dedicated exactly to that point? And you know, students, you walk up to that mic, or any, any professor or any uh, staff member walks up to that mic, and they want to take issue with something the speaker says, they can, and they should. Because that's the kind of environment in which ideas get refined and the, the, idea, the, the better ideas prevail. Every now and then you may hear an idea that you say, that makes me uncomfortable. I don't like that idea. Great. Engage it. When someone tells me they don't like one of my ideas, I usually say thank you. Because people won't actually do it that, that much. So when they do, you're lucky. But if you hear something, you think to yourself, wow, where's that coming from? Maybe you ask the person why they say it. Or maybe what you do is you reflect. Rather than reacting, you reflect. And then go see the person. Anyway, I think free expression is critical 
And students, if you can't question the faculty, if you can't ask them why they are teaching what they're teaching, or if you can't ask them to take it deeper because you're not sure you get where the conversation landed, then you're not getting the opportunity that we want to give you. And so I promise you that within the context of your relationship with faculty, you will always have the dignity of being able to ask and say what you want. You may not be right, and they may say, well, wait a minute, you have a little more to learn, and that's part of the whole experience, too. Thank you, Wyatt, for that question. Uh, hi, uh, I'm Terrence Dalton, I'm a junior. Yep. Um, from where I, I live, I'm from New York, and from where I live, I, I never heard about Franklin and Marshall, and I, if I hadn't gone out and looked for liberal arts schools, I probably wouldn't have found it. Um, are we, I, and I know we reach out to, the, we get amazing amounts of students from yeah. uh, international spheres, and we get from West Coast, and we, we're all over, but it's almost surprising sometimes how we don't reach out to the areas that seem most immediate and often seem that we could get wonderful talent and, and students and minds from. I, I don't know if the school is making any effort to, to, to improve upon that, but I, I, I would love yeah. to hear about it. Thank you. Uh, and and, and it, 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 you go ahead and stay there for a second. So uh, I saw in the back, although he might have since left, uh, Eric McGuire, who's our Vice President of Admission and Financial Aid, uh, and Julie Carrick, who's our Director of Admission, and they have a great team. Um, we're not necessarily as big a team as, you know, I don't know, University of Texas or something. We have, a, we, have a, we have a great team. And what we're trying to do is build a student body that comes from the full uh, global mosaic and American mosaic. Roughly about 16% or so of our students are international. And then of the 84% that are domestic, those kids are coming still majority from the mid-Atlantic, Pennsylvania, Maryland, New York, New Jersey. Mm -hmm. But over the last couple of years, many more from areas you know, 1,000 miles away or so. Uh, our growth states have been Florida, um, Texas, California, uh, and I think Illinois is about to get there. And then uh, the, and New England's been very strong for us too. So one thing to remember is that demographically, the population is shifting a lot in America. And for your school to be really strong 20 years from now, we're gonna need a lot of relationships in the South and the West where the population base of teenagers will be much bigger whereas the population base of teenagers in the mid-Atlantic area is already clearly going down because the six-year-olds are already six. Mm -hmm. So we're trying to build for the long term. Now, the offer is out. Help us find kids in your community that you want here. Mm -hmm. You could make four or five books yeah. from me just this year. <laughs> and so I'd love to have you just be involved with me. And thank you for asking right. the question. Yeah, thank you. Let's thank Dr. Porterfield. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.